Okay, we're going to start uh, Numbers today, and that actually is uh, the wilderness of Sinai, the wilderness of sin, the southern part of of Palestine. Uh, That's the way it looks today, and it's probably about the way it looked then. Uh, It may have been a little, well, if they had oases here and there, but um, it was not a nice place. It's not where you go to vacation. It's where you go through to get from where you are to where you want to be but it's not where you go to visit. And this is where God has taken them. This is where God has uh, led them and led them for uh, very, uh, very definite purposes. So let's uh, look at your notes and just think through uh, numbers. Again, we're going to look at major ideas, at structural issues, at, at kind of how you would put the book together and see the major uh, emphases, the major movements in the book. Uh, though there are a lot of interesting details uh, along the way. Uh, The structure of numbers really is is, uh, fairly simple, and there are a number of uh, ways that you see this structure. And uh, um, it has to do with two generations, first generation and the second generation. Now, those aren't pictures of real Israelites, you understand, but uh, it does illustrate generations. This is about parents and children and uh, grandparents to some extent, but uh, that's what it is. The first generation is failure, and so that's what we want right there, failure resulting in, in judgment. The second generation is, uh, has a very definite uh, uh, role or purpose for being in the wilderness, and that's preparation. So we've got two different purposes, two different things happening with the first generation and the second generation. The one, it's a terminal experience. For the first generation, it's going to be a terminal experience because of the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea. But for the second, it's going to be a preparation, a learning tool, a discipling instrument. And so we see how God is able to use this uh, wandering in the wilderness for two different purposes for these two generations. And in the middle, we have God who is faithful, God who is faithful to his promises, God who is faithful to himself and to his own holiness, and that's why he judges disobedience. That's why he judges sin. But faithful to his promises... So no matter how ungrateful the people get, no matter how rebellious they may become, yet God has a purpose that he's going to work out and God is going to remain committed to the people whom he has created and designated as his priest nation. And he's going to continue to work with them. And so this is really what we have. We have three parties in the book, first generation, the second generation, and God who is dealing with both according to their needs and according to his, uh, his purposes. Yeah, Victor? Well, I mean, faithful in terms of uh, uh, his holiness. He, he uh, applies his holiness to their uh, rebellion and judges them. I don't know if that's really theological terminology, but um, that's what it meant. Okay? Uh, so, um, so this is what we have in, uh, in uh, the structure, and uh, God, of course, bridges all the way through, but we find an emphasis on each of these groups, the first and second generation, as we go through the book. The first generation follows, but then fails. So it's not all bad, even for the first generation. It starts out on a pretty good note. And the book brings that out very clearly. Somebody mentioned the repetition of phrases. And uh, that's what we see here. So the first generation, we can uh, uh, summarize by these two words. Follow, fail. They follow at the beginning, but then they fail. In the first ten chapters, 1-1 through 10-36, there is a key phrase. And this recurs over and over and over again. Just as the Lord commanded. And I've written down the texts there for you, 154, 234, 95, and 18, and 20, and 23, and 1013. And it does occur in 1536, 
But in the first ten chapters, this seems to be what is characteristic of the first generation. Uh, in all parts, the priesthood, the people, and so forth, just as the Lord commanded. Boy, this is what you want. And so that's, uh, that's what we do see. For example, the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. Wow, what a positive, emphatic statement uh, with regard to uh, what God wants. He wants them to obey, and it says they all did. And so this is what we find at, uh, at the beginning. Uh, so just as the Lord commanded, that's a key phrase in the first uh, half of the book. But then as we turn to the second half of the book, another phrase begins to occur. All the children of Israel complained or contended. We find a marked shift at chapter 11. And so while it uh, started out on a very positive note, somewhere through here it turns sour. And so the phrase, all the children of the Israel complained and contended. And again, I've listed these for you in your notes, 11, 1, 14, 2, 27, 29, and 36, 17, 5, and 10, 23. And thir- uh, 20 verse 3 and 13 and 26, 9. And so we see this just interspersed throughout. And uh, very clearly we see this uh, positive start but then failure at the end with regard uh, to the first generation. And so noting these kinds of repetitions and then noting when they occur and saying, oh, looks like they're grouped, uh, can give you a... Uh, Uh, guidance into, okay, this first part of the book looks like we should expect it to be generally positive, and the second part is going to be generally negative. And that's what you find as you look at the details. So that's the first generation, following and then failing. And it says in 11.1, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And so in this specific act of rebellion, God uh, breaks forth in a, uh, in a judgment, a judgment that actually does end in uh, uh, death for uh, many of the people. And so we see that God is going to act uh, in judgment in this book. Now, the second generation then... The second generation is they follow, beginning in chapter 26. This is where we find the emphasis of the second generation. <clears throat> they follow and then, well, the book just leaves it up in the air. Now, you can write question mark, question mark, question mark there, and then a few years later you're going to go back and say, I wonder what he said here. Why have I got these question marks? I thought I should probably have you put a word in there or something. Uh, they follow and then What? You can put that in. What? Question mark, question mark, question mark. The book leaves it up in the air. And so we are left uh, wondering if they're going to follow their parents' example of a good start and then abject bad failure with God's judgment, or whether they're going to go ahead and continue to follow the Lord and go into the land. Now, we will find with the book of Joshua that they do go into the land. They do continue to follow and to obey, and uh, they conquer the land. And once they get into the land, then there begins this uh, slide, but uh, it, it takes longer. And so the second generation we find being actually prepared, and uh, they uh, follow. So a key phrase, just as the Lord commanded, just as the Lord commanded. 36.10, just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. This is uh, something that somebody mentioned. Uh, No brothers to inherit the land. They say, what happens to us, to our family? And and he actually says, uh, you'll inherit it, it'll be yours. But the point is, they are going to the Lord, they are going to Moses, they are asking God, what about this? They are depending upon God, they are showing sensitivity to what He is doing and what He has set up, and God is honoring that. 
And so that sort of is a, uh, a culminating statement in, in all of this, just as the Lord commanded. And so this becomes then the, uh, the characteristic of the second generation as it's presented in the book. And that will lead us then to Deuteronomy and Moses' uh, preparation of this people to, uh, uh, to uh, become observant of Torah and be able to go into the land. And we will find then historically, as the book of Joshua begins, that they do uh, uh, this. And so just looking at these little phrases and looking at the stories around which they occur help us to see what is in store and what is going on for the first generation and the second generation. When we get to Deuteronomy, uh, we're going to have specific statements about the positive nature of the second generation's experience in the wilderness. It wasn't just waste. It wasn't just marking time while mom and dad died. And that's uh, sort of the, the caricature of the book that you might have in a, in a casual reading. But there are very important things happening with the second generation. And Moses will point that out. God will point it out through Moses as we uh, get into Deuteronomy. Uh, next week we'll look at that. So that brings us to the, uh, just kind of looking now in a little more detail, uh, beginning at the initial chapters, uh, the first generation out of Egypt. And these uh, uh, chapters uh, 2 through uh, 15, uh, basically. And uh, we've got initial obedience, crisis of faith, the failure of unbelief, and then God's terminating discipline. And we'll look at these in a little bit of detail in that order. First of all, their initial obedience, chapters 2 through 10, their initial obedience. And there are a number of things that we see here. Here's some blanks you can fill in. First of all, the physical arrangement of the camp. The physical arrangement of the camp. They are instructed as to how they will move and, and what order they will take and uh, who will camp where and who will do what. And uh, we find that uh, they comply with this, that God is uh, giving them a very definite, uh, definite arrangement. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you sat down and drew this out because you're visual people and you like to just figure out what's going on. But notice the camp is uh, arranged around the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And Moses and Aaron and the priests would camp at the opening. Uh, they would be those who would uh, be, uh, in a sense, protecting uh, the, the tabernacle. They were the ones who were there for uh, the, the, the primary service of sacrifice for the nation as a whole. You've got the Kohathites and the Gershonites and the Merites. Those are Levites, Levitical families that would then camp uh, closest to the tabernacle. And then all of the rest of the tribes are arranged around the perimeter of the camp. And he gives the marching order as to how it will go when they start out, when he, the cloud moves and, and whatnot. Uh, but not to get into, you know, the details of this, but just to point out that God is, a, is arranging things. He's a God who arranges things. And they are complying with this from the beginning. And so he is demonstrating a number of things, one of which uh, there's going to be an orderly uh, uh, system of, of this, whole, uh, this whole movement around the wilderness and later. Yeah? You mean as far as families and intermarrying? They would intermarry, I would assume, but then the wife would go with the husband's tribe and become part of that tribe would be, I think, the, the norm but I don't know to what extent. All right, so, um, so, the, so we have that as the first uh, uh, order of business, and they, they comply with that. We have the spiritual ordering of the camp in chapters uh, 5 uh, and, and following, the spiritual ordering of the camp. And again, we, uh, um, we find... Uh, uh, ceremonially unclean people being isolated. We find uh, um, confession and restitution, how they are to carry this out. There's instruction about unfaithfulness. Uh, 
and the law of the Nazarite and so forth. And yeah, it's interesting. Uh, somebody mentioned <coughs> in the opening uh, sharing that, um, yeah, there's new stuff being added here that you might think uh, would have been uh, discussed um, earlier, would have been discussed in Exodus or in Leviticus. Uh, of course, they're still at the mountain in Numbers, but this material is included in Numbers. And so it's there because it has to do more particularly with what they will experience in the wilderness. And when we get to Deuteronomy, we're going to find a whole bunch of new things added with regard to the ceremonial and the civil and the... Uh, uh, regulations by which they are to live will find more new things. But again, it will be people who will be in a slightly different situation. And so we see that uh, God is not only concerned with the physical arrangement of the camp, but that the whole uh, way that he would meet with them. Remember, he's a holy God who is allowing himself to live in the presence of an unholy people through sacrifice, and that is what the tabernacle is all about. So it's not just, uh, you know, keeping things in order. There is a spiritual necessity about it as, as well. Thirdly, we see Moses in commissioning the Levites to service of the tabernacle. Uh, so we see Moses obeying, and it is, uh, and it is pointed out that he obeys. And so you can see that uh, he's just covering a bunch of different areas to show that they're basically in compliance. They observe the Passover in chapter 9, this great observance looking back to their deliverance from Egypt. And as they have been instructed, so they comply with this. And then finally, in their departing from Mount Sinai. So in chapters 9, uh, 15, all the way through chapter 10, uh, they are commanded to depart, and they do. And so we see here that uh, um, just uh, several different facets of their, their obedience. They are responding to God. Now remember, they have uh, made a golden calf and worshipped that, and God has judged them for that, and the uh, breach of covenant has been, has been uh, healed. Uh, Moses, uh, the new stones, and so forth. Uh, so it's kind of a new start in one sense, but it's very positive. And so we see that this is not all negative with this people, that there is a willingness and there is a, a responsiveness. But then we find uh, in Numbers chapter 10, as they uh, uh, are ready to depart, it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year, uh, so they have been... Uh, uh, but two years out of Egypt, that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So they started out for the first time according to the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And so again, you see this emphasis of obedience, of following, and uh, that is the uh, first generation in, in the lead. So Numbers chapter 10 is the chapter of their departure. And uh, this really completes the sequence that was begun in Exodus chapter 19. And in Exodus chapter 19, you find the same sort of a temporal and a geographical notice. And this really brackets that whole material, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and uh, makes it like one uh, book or one subpart of the whole, uh, the whole movement. So that brings us then to the, uh, the second phase, their crisis of faith in chapters uh, 11 and 12. And this is where we find the people complaining and, uh, uh, and dissension against uh, Aaron and Moses. And uh, three things to note here, just general complaining at the beginning of chapter 11. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And uh, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. And so we just have kind of a general uh, statement here. And this is just kind of abrupt. But it's a summary statement of what's, what's going to be happening, of what this section is going to start emphasizing. And so we just see right at the beginning a notice of general complaining. And there's a craving for meat. Um, 
Uh, verse 4, Now the mixed multitude are among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Ooh, look at that. And now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. And it talks about the manna. So they're just dissatisfied with what God has given to them uh, to sustain their, their physical life. And thirdly, we find the jealousy over Miriam and Aaron in, uh, in chapter 12. Now, somebody had mentioned uh, earlier, as you're just sharing of your, uh, your observations on reading, of uh, what these people had seen and uh, how much these people had, uh, had witnessed with respect to what God had done. And yet, what is their condition now? Put yourself in this situation. You've been out of your home now for two years, the only place you've ever known. And yeah, you were slaves and you were making bricks, but at least you had your own home. You could go home every night, you could, you know, fire up the oven and you'd have a hot meal and and a place to sleep and, uh, uh, you know, you had the food and you had a variety of food. And now you're out camping for two years and you only have one thing to eat. fun so yeah that would have been there but it's clear that they are comparing the richness of the variety of the diet that they had in egypt with the the spartan sparse you know uh, uh provision that god was giving them in this uh, miraculous uh, manna well let's be fair would that be a hardship sure it would would you feel that well sure it would and the kids would say, oh, do we have to eat manna again? And after a while, that's the way the parents start feeling. Do we have to eat this again? I mean, sometimes you feel like that here at Emmaus. Oh, my goodness, we got applesauce again. Whatever it is in that little spot as you go down the salad bar line. All right? Uh, <coughs> we become dissatisfied with sameness, don't we? And... Uh, And also with difficulty. Now, how many of you will willingly submit yourself to some kind of, I'll say, discomfort for something that's really, really important to you? Anybody got an example? So we know about voluntarily taking on ourselves hardship or allowing ourselves to undergo hardship when there is a a goal that is... uh, uh, there that's, uh, that's great enough, that's motivating enough, that is uh, potentially enjoying enough uh, to warrant it. We will submit ourselves to all kinds of hardship, won't we? But this people wouldn't. Why? Because it was hard, but people do hard things. Willingly, sometimes. All right, they were being commanded to do it, but, um, but we'll still put ourselves into situations where people run us. I mean, you've had coaches that just ran you until you puked, and you say, why are you doing this to us? But you'd still come back because you knew that down the road there was the competition and that was going to be enjoyable. So, yeah, but, but, but even when there's somebody there, you know, cracking the whip, we will still submit ourselves under many conditions. Why didn't they? I think that's exactly it. Because they did not have an accurate view of what it was that this was all about and what it was that God was doing with them. I mean, why had they become into existence as a people? To be the supremo, supremo, what is that word? How would you say that? The supremo nation. The numero uno, the uno numero nation. 
the number one big dog nation by which God wanted to bless all the nations of the earth. Is that an exalted privilege? Would that be something worth suffering for? Of course it is. God would have never asked them to do it if it hadn't been. And this is before Kadesh Barnea. This is before they're consigned to 38 more years of this. And I would submit that this is really a chief lesson that we can learn from the book of Numbers. Our willingness to submit to God's hand of discipline, discipling, is directly proportional to our vision of what the end is, of what He is doing and what He wants us to experience and where He wants to bring us in the end. And that once we catch a hold of that, once we really it sinks into us just how how great an exalted purpose and program that God has swept us into, we will be far more willing to endure whatever it is He calls us to do or endure in this life in faith and delight. And uh you know, that's, they had to have missed that. All they could think about at this time was their bellies. Boy, my stomach sure would like some garlic. Well, my mouth would sure some like some garlic. Okay? And so, um, it, it, it really is the way God works with His instruments, with His people, and it's still the same with us. And so... Yeah, can being a Christian entail hardship? Absolutely. What can I endure? Well, that's directly related to how how good an understanding you have of who God is and what He's doing and what He's desirous of accomplishing through us individually and together. And you can apply that in all kinds of areas, but certainly uh, that's what's going on here in a spiritual sense. So they got basically a crisis of faith. And faith is, you know, operating on the unseen, operating on the promise of God, operating upon the, the stated intentions of God as, as actual, as factual, as this is what's going to happen. I want to be a part of it. And then we find the faithfulness of the Lord in this, two ways, mercy and judgment, because even though he disciplines them for their lack of faith and their disobedience, he also exercises mercy, and he even provides for them meat. Their complaining was a sin. They should have been satisfied with what he gave them. And he judges them for their rebellious spirit over the issue of food. And then he gives them meat. I mean, God really is a gracious God. He really isn't just this harsh taskmaster who says, just deal with it. Now, he says that, but he always also says, I will make it worth it. I will sustain you. I'll encourage you. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the providence of God. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, and He gives His creatures things that they delight in, and and things that enrich and bless. And yet He still holds responsible for a person's individual response to that God. And so, you know, it's not an inconsistency. And uh, it's not even inconsistent with the parents, with the way parents raise children. Parents want to be sensitive to children's needs and even children's desires. But they also have to be responsible with respect to children and their attitude, their obedience, their, you know, just their submission to 
to the parents as God's authority and, and director. So I think there are parallels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think part of it was that. And, and also you realize that there are people who would have gratefully received the meat and uh, partaken of it as God had directed and would benefit from it. And so you remember, see, that God's working with two generations here, a generation that's in rebellion that's going to be judged with death. You know, it's a, t- a t- terminal discipline in the wilderness. But he's also dealing with the second generation whom he wants to enrich and whom he is training in the faith. And so, again, we see that way of, of God working. And that's the lesson of Jonah or Job and the, and, uh, and the clouds. The clouds bring, you know, two completely different experiences to man. It can bring devastation and pain and heartache and loss. And at the same time, the growth of crops and the enrichment and the production of food. And so one of the mistakes we make is that God is always only doing one thing in a given instant. And, and He's not. And we see that in our own lives as well. So I think there are a number of ways to approach that issue with regard, well, why would He give them meat if they're just, you know, is He just giving it to them because they're complaining? Is He just the, the doting parent who's giving in to a temper tantrum? Well, He's not. And the fact that they are disciplined some in death, proves that. So he's a good God. And maybe if they'd have just said, you know, would you ask God if we could have some meat? We really appreciate that. He'd have just said, yeah, just waiting for you to ask. Here it is. And he intended to give it to them anyway. And so again, you see, it's not just circumstance, but it is our attitude. It is our response of submission and faith that God is primarily interested in, and that's what he was primarily dealing with and interested in with his people. So Numbers has a rich, rich uh, uh, vein of, of treasures for th- with, with regard to uh, spiritual lessons. So there is, uh, uh, there is judgment, there, but there is mercy in that, and there is provision in that, and God is showing himself to be a good and gracious God. Let's just see if we can finish up this last point. The failure of unbelief. The spies, of course, go into the land. They dissuade the people from entering the land. And again, the people did not have a a solid enough understanding of what it was that God was doing. He'd promised Abraham land, and he'd promised to bring the people into the land. And God had shown that he was uh, fully capable of dealing with an army as mighty as the Egyptians. Does that mean he was incapable with dealing with the little garrison that would be found at Jericho? Or these giants in the land that the spies saw? But you see, they just didn't make the connection. Their God wasn't big enough. The reality of his presence and his purpose and his intentions was not foremost in their minds and in their thinking. And so, again, three things. They become overwhelmed by their circumstances. They're looking down. They're looking at the circumstances. They're looking at the the greatness of the the physical threat. And they are missing the greatness of their God. Unbelief through fear. Circumstances, when they were focused on circumstances, produce fear. When we focus upon God and His greatness over the circumstances... Then we replace the fear of man, which is what circumstances is all about, with the fear of God. And that's what then motivates and enables belief. And belief on the basis of promises. And so um, that's what they needed. They needed to, to come to a submission to God, a confidence in God, on the basis of his promises. And that's basically what uh, uh, Caleb and Joshua said. No, God wants us to go into this land. Let's go in and take it. Uh, Not discounting the formidable obstacles that they would face, but having God as a bigger part in the equation than the uh, the rest of the spies. And if we compare 14.3 with verse 31... What we find is 
the excuse that they gave for not going in. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? God, you aren't thinking of our kids. We are. What's God say? Your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. They shall know the land which you have despised, and you'll die in the wilderness. And Numbers, why is it called the book of Numbers? Because they took a census twice, since I or two censuses. I don't know what the plural of that word is. And what did the census show? The census showed, yeah, but what did it show about population? The population of the, gen- the, of the second generation after the first generation died was slightly more than it had been at the first generation. And what the first generation say? Oh, man, you're going to take us in there and our, our kids are going to die. He keeps the kids alive in the wilderness for 38 years while they die because of unbelief. And he takes their children into the land without them. Do you see how the logic of, of unbelief really is, you know, the illogic from, from God's standpoint. 